For decades, one question haunted aviation enthusiasts. How fast did the SR-71 Blackbird really fly? The official answer? Mach 3 Plus. That mysterious plus sign became legendary, but nobody knew what it actually meant. Then retired Lieutenant Colonel Gil Burleson walked into a bar in England and said seven words that changed everything. But before we get to what he revealed, you need to understand why this aircraft was built in the first place. Because the story starts with a crisis. It's 1960, height of the Cold War. American U-2 spy planes are getting shot down over Soviet territory. Francis Gary Powers is sitting in a Soviet prison after his reconnaissance aircraft was destroyed by a surface-to-air missile. The Pentagon has a brutal problem. How do you gather intelligence on your enemies when they can blow your planes out of the sky? The answer came from Lockheed Skunk Works, led by the legendary Kelly Johnson. Their mission? Build an aircraft so fast and so high that nothing on Earth could touch it. What they created changed warfare forever. December 22, 1964. Test pilot Bob Gilliland takes the first SR-71 into the California sky. But this isn't just another jet. The titanium skin heats to over 500 degrees Fahrenheit during flight, causing the entire airframe to expand nearly a foot. The fuel tanks leak on the ground by design, sealing only when the metal expands at screaming speeds. Engineering merged with artistry into one black beast. The Air Force officially lists the speed as Mach 3 Plus. That little plus sign appears everywhere, on specification sheets, flight suits, mission briefings. Every SR-71 crew member wears it like a badge of honor. But what does it actually mean? That question haunted everyone. Enemy nations, American fighter pilots, aviation enthusiasts. For over two decades, nobody knew the truth. Until Gil Burleson decided to have some fun with it. Burleson flew F-111 aardvarks before joining the SR-71 program. During his two-week tryout at Beale Air Force Base, that Mach 3 Plus designation is everywhere he looks. It starts to haunt him. When he returns to RAF Lackenheath in England, Burleson pulls off something legendary. He starts adding grease pencil plus signs next to every number three he can find. Fire safety posters, emergency procedures, flight planning boards, everywhere. The base safety officer notices. He calls the fire marshal, completely confused about this mysterious new classification that doesn't exist in any manual. Eventually, they trace it back to Burleson. He gets a cease and desist order. But the legend has begun. Fast forward 18 months. Burleson made it. He's now an SR-71 pilot stationed at RAF Mildenhall, flying the most dangerous reconnaissance missions of the Cold War. The missions out of England are more demanding than those flown from Okinawa deeper into contested territory. One evening, Burleson meets his old F-111 buddies at the Lackenheath Officers Club. These are fighter pilots, competitive by nature. They remember the plus sign incident. They know Burleson now flies the legendary Blackbird, and they want answers. The drinks flow, the laughter echoes. Then the questions start. How high does it really fly? How fast does it really go? Burleson plays along. He looks around nervously, pretending to check if anyone's listening. He leans in close, making his friends believe they're about to hear classified information. The tension builds. Then he tells them something that would eventually make it into Richard Graham's book, SR-71 Blackbird Stories, Tales, and Legends. But to understand what Burleson revealed, you first need to know about a poem that every pilot knows by heart. In the early days of powered flight, pilot John Gillespie Magee Jr. wrote, High Flight. The poem captures the pure joy of flying, slipping the surly bonds of earth, dancing through clouds, climbing sunward into the blue. The final lines became iconic. They speak of reaching windswept heights with easy grace, of treading the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, and putting out your hand to touch the face of God. Television stations played this poem late at night before signing off the air. It represented the absolute pinnacle of what aviation could achieve. The highest point of human flight described in poetry. Now remember those words, because here's what Lieutenant Colonel Gil Burleson told his friends that night. Burleson makes them promise not to tell a soul. He warns them he'll deny it until the day he dies. His friends lean in closer, barely breathing. Then Burleson says, 
You know that part in High Flight where it talks about putting out your hand to touch the face of God? Well, when we're at speed and altitude in the SR, we have to slow down and descend in order to do that. Let that sink in. The SR-71 flew so high and so fast that it operated above where the poem placed the face of God. To reach that poetic pinnacle of human flight, Blackbird pilots had to throttle back and come down. But how is that even possible? What kind of machine operates beyond what we consider the edge of space? The SR-71's operational ceiling was officially listed at 85,000 feet. That's over 16 miles high. At that altitude, the sky turns dark purple. You can see the curvature of the Earth. Pilots wear full pressure suits, essentially becoming astronauts. But here's what makes Burleson's revelation so significant. The SR-71 didn't just fly high, it flew fast at that altitude. Former SR-71 pilot B.C. Thomas explained the flight manual set a maximum speed limit of Mach 3.3. Not because the engines couldn't push harder, they absolutely could. The limit existed because the air entering those engines couldn't exceed 800 degrees Fahrenheit without causing damage. But in combat situations, different rules applied. Major Brian Schul experienced this during an operational mission over Libya. Surface-to-air missiles launched toward his aircraft. Schul does what every SR-71 pilot was trained to do. He accelerates. In his book, The Untouchables, Scholl reported reaching speeds in excess of Mach 3.5 while evading those missiles. Not Mach 3.2, not Mach 3.3, Mach 3.5 or higher. The missiles couldn't catch him. They ran out of fuel and tumbled from the sky while his Blackbird continued accelerating. He was moving faster than a rifle bullet. Some aviation experts believe the SR-71 could theoretically reach Mach 4 under ideal conditions. That's over 3,000 miles per hour. The Soviet Union stationed MiG-25 Foxbat interceptors specifically to counter the Blackbird. Sweden documented regular intercept attempts over the Baltic Sea. But they never caught one. Not once. Not in over 30 years of operations. Not a single SR-71 was ever shot down by enemy fire. When missiles launched, the standard procedure was simple. Go faster. The genius of Kelly Johnson's design meant the SR-71's engines functioned as turbojets at lower speeds and became ramjets at high Mach numbers. The faster the aircraft went, the more efficient the engines became. Here's the perfect irony. The titanium skin was purchased from the Soviet Union through shell companies. The Soviets unknowingly provided material for the very aircraft that would spy on them for decades. The pilots literally flew a different aircraft at Mach 3 than the one that took off from the runway. The SR-71 flew over 3,500 operational sorties without a single loss to enemy action. March 6, 1990, the SR-71 makes its final official flight. Lieutenant Colonel Ed Yielding and Reconnaissance Systems Officer J.T. Vita are flying from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. to deliver their aircraft to the Smithsonian Museum. The Secretary of the Air Force has one request. Set a coast-to-coast -coast speed record. Let America see one last time what this magnificent machine can do. They take off from Palmdale in darkness. Refuel over the Pacific. Light the afterburners. Then turn east. Yielding crosses the California coast at sunrise, accelerating through Mach 2.5. Minutes later, they reach Mach 3.3. They cover the continental United States in 64 minutes and 20 seconds. Average speed, 2,144 miles per hour. A journey that takes most people five and a half hours, completed in just over an hour. JT Vita logged more hours in the SR-71 than any other crew member in history, 1,392.7 hours. He passed away from cancer two and a half years later, but his legacy remains untouchable. So what did Lieutenant Colonel Gil Burleson really reveal that night in the bar? He confirmed what many suspected, but no one could prove. The SR-71 didn't just fly at Mach 3 plus. That plus sign represented capabilities beyond published specifications, beyond official records, beyond the limits of what most people thought possible. When Burleson said SR-71 pilots had to slow down and descend to touch the face of God, he was telling the absolute truth. That aircraft operated in a realm reserved for rockets and spacecraft. The Blackbird sits in museums now. The Smithsonian. 
the Museum of Flight in Seattle, the Strategic Air Command Museum in Nebraska. They're beautiful even standing still, but they're more than museum pieces. They're reminders of what can be achieved when engineering excellence, pilot courage, and national will align toward a single goal. Lieutenant Colonel Burleson is retired now. He openly shares his story because the secrets no longer matter the same way. But his legacy remains powerful. Seven words that confirmed what aviation enthusiasts wondered for decades. We have to slow down and descend. That's the legacy of the SR-71 Blackbird. An aircraft so extraordinary that even describing its true capabilities sounds like exaggeration. An aircraft that still holds speed records set over 40 years ago. An aircraft that flew above the highest reaches of human flight described in poetry. And that tells you everything about the people who designed it, built it, and flew it into harm's way. If this story moved you, hit that like button and subscribe. We've got more incredible untold stories from aviation history coming your way. The legends deserve to be remembered.